Good evening, everyone. I got the the funniest phone call the other day. Um, it was from Paul McCartney. And he found out the subject of tonight's lesson. He said, hey, Jude. I've been working on that all week. Yeah, yeah, keep working on it, huh? All right. Yeah, tonight we're going to be surveying the book of Jude and then taking a lesson from there. Um, one more week, and we will have finished uh, surveying the books of the Bible on our Sunday nights. Uh, it's been quite a journey. It's been very enjoyable and fruitful for me, and I pray it has for you as well. Uh, very thankful for your presence here tonight and hope that uh, everyone is doing well. Let's go ahead and have a prayer and we'll begin our study tonight. We thank you so much, Father, for the blessings of this day. We're gr so grateful for the time of worship that we had earlier and for the time that we have tonight. We pray, Father, that as we look into your word, you would bless us, that you would strengthen us, and help us, Father, to be better fitted for service in your kingdom. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. Thank you for forgiving us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jude is another one of our one-chapter books in the New Testament. There are a few of them, surprisingly enough. The author is Jude. He refers to himself as the brother of James, which would make him the half-brother of Jesus. Two of the books in our New Testaments, Jude and James, were written by half-brothers to Jesus, who, if you will recall, did not believe in him for a long period of time. It was written probably 61 to 62 in that time frame. Um, it, it can't be much later than that. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But if you look at... Um, at Matthew's list of the siblings of Jesus, you will find James and Jude both on that list. Being the brother of uh, James, and this is not Zebedee, because uh, the son of Zebedee, he was dead about 40, 41, maybe as late as 42 when he was beheaded. And this letter dates much later than the death of James the Apostle. But James, the brother of Jesus, was a leader in the church. But being the brother of James presupposes the way that he phrases it that James was still living at the time that this was written. And James died in 62, and so it had to be written prior to that time, but the circumstances that are being addressed here push it later towards the death of James. So 61 to 62 is a real good time frame for us with this letter. The recipient is the church at large. There may have been... A specific congregation it was addressed to initially but um, when he uh, in verse 1 says to those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ he may have written that to a specific area but it's not mentioned and so it has been judged um, by practically everyone to be a broad letter to all of those in the vicinity the purpose of the letter was to warn the church against certain teachers and their heresies which endangered the faith of believers. Again, the further we get into the first century, the more those heresies start popping up. And you see in the later writings many of those things being addressed by uh, the leaders in the church. The key verse is verse 3, and we're going to be returning to this verse very shortly. Beloved, while I was very diligent, to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to all the saints. The book of Jude. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy peace and love be multiplied to you beloved while i was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation 
I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But we want to remind you, though, you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains until darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, excuse me, the way of Cain, having run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots on your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the wind. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom the, is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seven from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which godly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. This, uh, this particular letter has uh, a pretty basic tone to it. And that these teachers that are stirring up things falsely have in store for them the same things that were brought upon those during the Old Testament who did not keep their place, who did not honor God, who did not respect His Word and His people. And you can see so many of the Old Testament examples being brought forth in the book of James. There's one thing in particular I want to bring to your attention before we get into the meat of the lesson. Down in verse 9, after it says they speak evil of dignitaries, yet even Michael the archangel. So, Michael the archangel, being an archangel, would be in the upper echelon of angels. And these are speaking evil of dignitaries. It is believed by some commentators they were speaking evil of elders within the church, leaders within the church. And yet Michael the archangel, when in contending with the devil, 
when they disputed about the body of Moses. What book is that found in, in the Old Testament? It's not there. You just learned something new in the New Testament that happened in the Old Testament. All we read about as Joshua completes the story in that last chapter of Deuteronomy is that he was buried in the mountains of Nebo by God. Now how God chose to do that, we don't know. But here we see Michael the archangel contending with Satan over the body of Moses. Now, going all the way back, and we'll come back to this specific, going all the way back to the very beginning, what was Satan's plan to foil God's plan in bringing Messiah into the world? Well, now God has set aside a group of people, the family of Abraham, through whom he's going to bring the Messiah into the world. But Satan doesn't know which one it is. And these people have followed Moses for 40 years. And so Moses comes back from the dead after Satan gets a hold of his body. What do you think he's going to be able to lead God's people to do? He could destroy them and thus foil God's plan and the seed that was going to be coming down to provide Messiah in the world. So Satan, I mean, you got to give him props, right? He's ambitious. Everything he can do, what does he try to do when Jesus is born? He destroys all the children in a village. I mean, th this is his plan. He's got to foil God's plan. And he thought he had achieved victory on the cross, but he didn't realize he had set the terms of his own demise. Fulfilling Genesis 3, 15, you shall bruise his heel, but he shall crush your head. So here we have this situation where Michael, in contending with Satan for the body of Moses, would not even bring a reviling accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. We need to pay very careful attention to what that instruction is right there and how we speak about Satan. If an archangel would not bring a reviling accusation against him, we should be very careful about the songs that we teach our children. If Satan doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. In light of this verse, do you think that that's an appropriate thing to teach our children? The gospel chariot, if Satan gets in the way, we're going to roll all over him? Have you thought about that? Might be something we want to think about. Because if we don't teach our children, you know, we need to have respect for Satan. Not, not, the, not like we respect God, but I mean, he is very powerful. But he also is in a position that even an archangel would not bring a reviling accusation against him. And we, human beings, are made a little lower than the angels, according to the Hebrew writer. So we should be careful what we say and what we teach our children. To our lesson. I want to talk to you about once delivered. Verse 3. Behold, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. We're going to break this verse down into parts. The original purpose of Jude was sidelined by more pressing matters. You know, that's happened before. Preachers, you know, you, you plan a lesson for a week, and then that morning something happens, and you've got to address it. It happens to politicians. It happens in business. It happens in all kinds of settings. Here it happens to the, the biblical writer Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. If this was merely putting a man under hypnosis and making him right, why would that appear in there? God doesn't take the personality away. God doesn't take away the humanity of the instrument who's writing this, but he guides so that what God desires to be there, every word is found there. 
And so it's just interesting when you look at that. You know, I was going to write to you concerning our common salvation. Wouldn't you like to read that letter? Yeah, I'd like to read that one. God had other ideas. Moved him to write concerning this situation that was, that was pressing. Our common salvation here refers to that which is shared by all of the called or the sanctified in Christ that are addressed here. And that would include us down to this age. Our common salvation, the salvation that is shared by all of the saints. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. There is a group within the brotherhood that thinks that word contend has an O-U-S on the end of it. You're laughing, Ken, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Contending for the faith is not being contentious for the faith. There is a marked difference between those two things. It is important for us to contend earnestly for the faith without being contentious. Exhorting. This is strong encouragement towards a stated goal. So he's... He's wanting, he's pushing them in the direction of contending earnestly. That is to strive with all of their ability and power, all of their strength. To contend earnestly for the faith, not in the sense of trust or belief, but rather of the thing that is believed. That's what the faith refers to. Now, there's a, a big difference between faith and the faith. And it's important for us to, to bear down on this distinction for just a moment. Because when we read these things, we need to understand what we're reading. There are many times in the New Testament where the definite article does not appear before the word pistos. For faith. And so faith is in the general sense of belief or trust. When the definite article appears before that, and it says the faith, then it is that system of that of things that is believed. It doesn't talk about your personal belief or trust that you have in God. Why is this important? We'll get to that in just a moment. Let's look at a few verses here. Go down to verse 20 in our same opening. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Your most holy faith there is the thing which is believed. It is, it is, it is your trust, rather, not the thing that is believed. The definite article is not there, so in the same letter, he uses it in one place, and he doesn't use it in the other, showing a difference between those two words. You know, I believe that Jesus is coming again. I have faith that he's coming back again. That is not the faith. That is faith. So we build ourselves up in your most holy faith, in our, in our belief and trust in God. When we get to these other passages, you're going to see the word the faith that is there. Whenever you see the faith, you need to understand that that is not talking about our trust. It is talking about that which is believed. In other words, the doctrine of Christ. That, that is what is, is under consideration. Contend earnestly for the faith. Which was once for all delivered. Once for all delivered. This is where I want us to just take just a moment and think about this. And you're going to say, well, Mark, you said it wasn't written until 61 or 62. Well, the ideas that are present in this letter were delivered at the very beginning by Christ himself and his apostles. And while it was being uh, transmitted orally for a given period of time, and we don't know what other writings they were using during the time that did not survive, that 
were not incorporated into what we know as the Bible. They were sharing these principles, these facts, these uh, examples, these commandments, these encouragements from the very beginning. Once for all delivered. Brief Greek lesson. The word hapak. That is once for all. Is translated in the English. Means once only and forever. Once only and forever. It may be delivered again. But you're delivering again that which was once only and forever delivered. Okay, how many times did Abraham Lincoln give the Gettysburg Address? Once. How many times has it been re-given? I've quoted it. I've read it. Other people have read it. They've quoted it. They've put it on social media. They put it in newspapers. They put it on the television. You've seen actors act it out. I mean, all of these things. But it was only delivered one time, and it was completed and it was never added to or taken away from. That's the idea of this word. It's the idea of this word. And this is a very important thing to bear in mind when we're talking about the faith, the system of things that we believe, that which is believed. Once only and forever. This is a, this is a statement that shows that Christianity is a system of revealed teaching which by its very nature is unalterable and it is normative. You cannot change it. And it establishes the norm by which all those who wish to do God's will will conform themselves. This is an extremely important principle of scripture and it is far too often overlooked especially by those who continue to come up with new ideas once only delivered once forever delivered or as it is translated in the new king james once for all delivered It shows that from the very beginning, a clearly defined and authoritative doctrine was present in Christianity. In other words, Christian doctrine did not evolve over the course of decades. It was once delivered for all. It may have been oral, and God was guiding by his Holy Spirit those who spoke those words so that the same things were being taught in all the churches and once it was written down, what was written was not different than what they had been teaching all the time. You, you know what would have happened with those letters? If they'd been teaching something for 30 years, and all of a sudden a letter shows up and it teaches something different than what they'd been taught all along? They would have torn those things up. Because when those words were being spoken by the apostles, what were they doing to confirm those words? They were performing miracles that confirmed that their words were authoritative. And then you write something that's different. They would have recognized that very quickly. That's why when you get down to verse 4, talking about these false teachers, that they're being told to stay away from them, ignore them, contend earnestly for the faith because they're not teaching you what you've been taught from the very beginning. We have a clearly defined and authoritative doctrine in the church. It is known as the doctrine of Christ, the perfect law of liberty. It is known as the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. All of these phrases refer to the same thing, and that is the faith, our doctrine. Now, when you look around us and you see the practice and the beliefs of a lot of people that claim to follow Christ, do you see something that is clearly defined and authoritative that everyone is following? You don't. Do you see something that is normative? 
Some of it is, some of it isn't. And what we have to do, I can't control everybody else, but what we have to do is constantly go back to God's Word, see what it says, and conform our faith and our practice to what God's Word says because it was once for all delivered. And it is that which we should be contending, contending earnestly for. Now, that may seem a little bit academic, and I apologize for that. However, the principle of all of that is extremely important to every single Christian. Ultimately, do you know what it is? You can trust this because this is what everybody has always had. Even when it was verbal, this is what they had. The Holy Spirit preserved it in written form because this is what they had, what they followed, and this is what God intends for all of us to follow. If we don't, if we don't do that, we find ourselves going against the teaching of Deuteronomy, of Proverbs, and the book of Revelation. In all three places, basically in the law, in the beginning of our Bibles, in the wisdom literature, somewhere in the middle, and in the closing book, don't add to, don't take away from. And so we find ourselves contending earnestly against God, or we find ourselves contending earnestly for the faith. And there's nothing in between. So we must be diligent in teaching and preaching that which is right, whether it's from cradle roll all the way up through our senior saints. We need to teach truth. Yes, you have to adjust it to age and abilities. I get that. But the truth is still the truth. Whether you present it on a three-year-old level or you present it on a 60-year-old level, the truth is still the truth. Let's keep it there. Let's make sure that we don't fall into the sway, as it were, of worldly uh, pressures. Because worldly tastes in religion vary almost by the minute and change and change again. And just when you think you figured out a change, then it changes again. Who would have ever thought, seriously, I know some of you may not be old enough, but who would have thought 35 or 40 years ago that there'd be rock and roll bands playing in worship services on Sunday morning? Who would have ever thought? I, would, I mean, I would never have thought that. Pipe organ, sure. Even sounds holy, doesn't it? Right? Rock and roll band, no. The... First Baptist Church in Franklin, Kentucky, about a year before I left, split right down the middle. You know what they split over? Rock and roll band versus a pipe organ. And split up into two churches. And in most towns in the Midwest and in the South, the First Baptist Church is usually pretty conservative. The preacher, the youth minister, and the music director all led the way with the rock and roll band. And it split the church. You know, we often think that we're the only ones that split over things like that. It's happening all over the place. But the problem that, that I never could get anybody to talk to me about is, well, what's the difference between a guitar and a pipe organ? What's the difference? You know, one sounds holy, it bellows. But what's the difference? Yeah, and there isn't. It's a, it's a mechanical instrument, right? But who would have ever thought there'd be rock and roll bands? You know, these churches that have rock and roll bands now were telling me that, you know, I was going to hell because I was listening to Led Zeppelin in the 70s. And now they got rock and roll bands in church, and I'm up here singing a cappella. Now, what's, what's up with that? You know? 
You know, if you play that record backwards, it, it gives you a message from Satan. No, I don't play it backwards. It messes up the needle on my record player. You know, but I mean, these are the groups that were telling us all this years ago. We've got to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered. And if we just keep going back to simple, primitive, New Testament Christianity, we cannot fail. We can't go wrong. We know that we will be in the will of God. And that's where I desire to be, and I pray that's where you desire to be. Our brothers prepared a song for us tonight. And... I'm going to tell you, I got a lot of interesting comments at the door this morning after this morning's sermon. And maybe you've had some time to think about it too, and maybe there are some things you would like to, to ask for prayers for. I don't know. Or you may be here tonight and you've never named Christ and put him on in baptism. We'd love to talk to you about that as well. But as our brother leads this song, uh, please make your wishes known to us. Let us stand and sing.